Do you happen to suffer from the Sunday blues where you know you'll be back to work on Monday and it just ruins your Sunday night? And some of you might even suffer from anxiety because, well, your work culture, it's a complete hot mess. Then again, maybe you have a dictator for a boss that makes your life completely miserable. Or maybe your job is just so boring that it is draining the life right out of you. Whatever your reason, if the feeling goes beyond just the Sunday night and it's impacting your entire life, then I think that you'll get a little bit of value from this video. Now, it just so happens that what you're about to watch, it happens to be my very first video from two years ago. And I've been asked a lot lately why I even chose to create a YouTube channel in the first place. And let me say, there is a reason that I consider my time to be my most valuable asset. Well, outside of my family, of course. And I figured that re-releasing this video would really help tell that story. And then again, maybe it would help act as a wake-up call for a handful of you that are living the life that I used to have. Full disclaimer, I admit that the audio isn't the best and my editing wasn't my finest work, but that's okay because we all start somewhere. And with that said, this is what started it all. Enjoy. Well, here we are. I quit. I promised myself I would never quit anything in my life. Actually, that was one of the best days of my life. But it took me a long time to decide that that was the right path for both me and my family. Leading up to this, there were roughly five lessons in life that I needed to come to terms with before I could make that final jump. My daily routine was get up early, commute to work an hour or two, pile through as many emails and meetings and documents that I could, and then commute home for another hour or two. It was literally Groundhog's Day every day. Commute, work, commute. There was no red pill for me to get out. Time was slipping by and I felt like I was literally a spectator in my own life. My only reprieve at work was to go grab myself a cup of coffee or to go use the restroom, which didn't always work in my favor. So what exactly got me to this point? I had grown up in a tiny little town in the middle of nowhere, Montana, where both of my parents had blue collar jobs. We got by, but I was not given a silver spoon. I knew that everything that I was going to be getting in life, I would have to earn myself. And for that reason, I had chosen to go into the Air Force, one, to serve my country, but also to pay for my college. I had very humble beginnings and I had a lot of room to grow. And that, that was what set the stage for me needing to prove to both myself and everyone else around me that I was the best. Here's the scene. I had graduated from college in 2004, and I began my career with a company called Albertsons. This was just before the Great Recession, and I, I got to observe constant layoffs. And then the company was sold, and we had to re-interview for our own jobs. Even after that, layoffs were common for several years after that. So it was no surprise that moving on to another company was an easy choice for me to make. So from there, I went on to go work for Target Corporate, which was a heck of a lot more fun and a heck of a lot more stable. But even Target has a bit of a dark side. Having come to Target as a middle manager from another company, I was referred to as an external. And quite honestly, anyone coming to Target from an outside company is labeled or branded as an external. Regardless of my performance, I was always going to be labeled as an external at Target. Now, I absolutely loved the people that I had worked with, but the bureaucracy and the subjective biases led me to believe that I was never going to be fully accepted at Target. Which is funny because Target hangs its hat on being inclusive, which I can attest simply wasn't true for me. All of these experiences then led me to Amazon, where they only hire the best, which is exactly where I wanted to go to because, well, I wanted to prove that I was the best. Amazon gave me an incredible compensation package for which I am extremely thankful for. But the majority of that compensation is given in the form of RSUs or stock that is fully awarded over a multi-year term. And this is referred to as the golden handcuffs. If you want the treasure at the end of the rainbow, then you need to survive the next four years. In most jobs, you put in your 40 hours a week and you turn off your responsibility the moment that you go home and you live a relatively balanced life. Having been in corporate positions all of my career, I, I was used to working 50 to 60 hours a week, and that was relatively common. And for the most part, I was okay with that. The environment was relatively stable, but even then there were always these concerns of layoffs or the company being sold or, or simply the unknown. Always a hint of fear, but not overwhelming. But that all changed when I went to Amazon. My first week on the job and one of my direct reports had quit. And then I had taken on all of their workload until I could get a new person hired which took nearly a year to fill. 
That means that I was doing both my job and another person's job for my first year at Amazon. Amazon is tough enough, but when you have to do two jobs at once, it's not sustainable. This was a pretty clear indication of what my time at Amazon was going to be like. For context, the average tenure when I started was only 10 months. That means some people were only working a week and quitting, and then the others were maybe lasting until 15 months and then quitting. Within my four years of being there, I was on my seventh manager, and quite honestly, only two of them were good. Amazon is a transitory workforce by choice because they turn and burn employees. It is extremely difficult when you first come to Amazon because if you were hired, you were probably the best of the best at the company that you had come from. Well, guess what? When Amazon only hires the best, suddenly you realize that you're just average. Everyone is competing to be the best and outdo their colleagues. You try to one-up one another by working more hours, writing more documents, or just getting more results. In reality, it is just a race to the bottom. Teams become political and they try to set up other groups to fail just in order to make themselves look better. Even managers are willing to lie and make things up just to cover their own mistakes because they too operate in fear. As if things weren't competitive enough, the managers must force rank their employees to showcase the bottom 10% that need to be on a pivot plan. Or in layman's terms, they need to make life so miserable that they quit. It doesn't matter if they're doing a good job or not, they are the bottom 10%. And it's a list you don't want to be on. The fear is the only true motivation at Amazon. I made some fantastic friends while I was there, but generally, everyone is competing against one another. I often hear from friends from other companies that quit their jobs and they refer to the people as being cogs in the machine. That doesn't even begin to describe it at Amazon. People at Amazon are more like napkins. They are disposable goods that are thrown away on a whim. They might be replaced, but more than likely they're not. When it was all said and done, I had a career at Amazon for over five years. And I, I call it a career because quite honestly, anyone that can survive Amazon longer than four years deserves to call it a career. As a manager, I had interviewed hundreds of people and for years, I had lied to those interviewees. Almost every single one of them would ask me, what is it like to work at Amazon? And of course, I would give them some fake upbeat response, such as the work is very rewarding, but of course, it's very challenging, blah, blah, blah. After being away from Amazon for the past two years, I think that I can now answer that question truthfully. Imagine for a moment that you're swimming underwater and you have this goal that you want to swim to the deepest part of the pool. You put all your effort to reach the bottom, but you are far too buoyant, so you begin to release all the oxygen from your lungs. You give it all your energy, you're, you're close, but you just can't reach it. And then you realize you need to get back to the surface for air. And since you're not on the bottom, you can't push off. You look up and you see the surface and suddenly it feels like it's about 100 feet away. You are now swimming with all your energy just to survive. Your muscles begin to burn. Your heart is pounding in both your lungs and your throat. All the while, your lungs are screaming to get air. And then your mind begins to race and you begin to question if you can even make it. Milliseconds begin to feel like an eternity and your vision begins to slowly close in. Now stop. Imagine forever being in that moment. And now you know what it feels like to work at Amazon. Changing gears just a little bit. I was having this conversation with someone of the boomer age bracket, and he may or may not be a relative. And he made this comment that the workers today are no longer loyal. In turn, this conversation had me thinking about my career. While I was in the military, I showed loyalty to my country and the Constitution, but I had no intention of staying in the military, but I don't consider my leaving to be disloyal. Throughout my career, I had to deal with rounds of layoffs, being acquired by another company, having to re-interview for your job, feeling like an outcast and being labeled as an external despite having incredible results, and literally being treated like a disposable object where the company constantly squeezes you for more. But hey, according to this boomer, the problem with society is that employees are no longer loyal. Seriously. Just before I made the decision to quit, I took a very long, hard look at what brought me to this point. When I first began my career, I had this personal brand that I was this lighthearted, easygoing kind of guy that would do anything I could to get the job done and help anyone along the way. But my personal brand at Amazon was this impatient person that disrespected anybody that wasted my time. I had my goals to accomplish and don't get in my way. That was me, just like every other hardened Amazonian that's been there more than four years. But how did I get to this point? It didn't exactly happen overnight. The reason is simple. It's the analogy of how you boil a frog. 
If you throw a frog into a pot of boiling water, it jumps out to save its life. It knows it's in danger. But if you put a frog in tepid water and slowly increase the temperature, the frog doesn't realize the impending doom and it gets cooked to death. In a matter of speaking, this is what had happened to me and how I had changed over time. And I'm guessing there are a lot of you out there that can probably relate to this. In my career, each year, I would make the smallest of changes to myself to adhere to the corporate principles and the expectations placed on me based on my performance review. The temperature of my pot of water was slowly going up each year. But suddenly, one day you wake up and you've missed your two-year-old daughter's birthday because you had to fly to some random city to have a forgettable meeting with a bunch of forgettable suppliers. For some reason, the needs of the company outweighed everything that was important in my life. My pot of water was about to boil and I needed to make some changes. There was no balance in my life. Speaking of balance, I was in a meeting with Jeff Bezos. Yes, that Jeff Bezos. And he made the comment literally verbatim that there is no such thing as work-life balance. Seriously. What the hell, Sinky Finland is known for their split pea soup, and I think it's great. You know what else is great? Hit that like button. Better yet, hit subscribe. In the Midwest, they have this thing at bars called a meat raffle. The rules are very simple. You buy a ticket. If your number is called, then you win some random assortment of meats. There's just one stipulation. You need to be present to win. Simple enough, right? In 2004, it was my senior year of college, and I'd received a call from my dad. And if your dad is anything like mine, he never calls. And when he does, it's probably not the best of news. He had told me that my mother had aggressive cancer and that she had about a week to live. She was 62. She had worked all of her life, and she had never really taken a vacation or obviously didn't get the chance to retire. One of my mother's parting words or confession was that she regretted not spending more time with me. You see, when I was 12 years old, my mother decided to go to college. And when you live in the middle of nowhere, Montana, college is five hours away. For my teenage years, I only saw my mother over the summers. And at that time, we didn't have the cell phones of today where you have pictures and videos of everyday life. Sadly, I can't remember what my mom's voice sounds like anymore. Her most important advice to me and biggest regret was that you don't get second chances in life. You need to be present to win. At the beginning of the pandemic, I had hit my wall of self-actualization with my career where I came to recognize there were five lessons in my life that I needed to address. My first lesson was I have nothing more to prove to myself or anyone else. And the second lesson was no matter what anyone else tells you, the company will not be loyal to you. It is your responsibility to take care of you. And the third lesson is if fear is your main motivation, which I dare say most Amazonians fall in that, then it's time to move on. The fourth lesson, over time, if you continue to make small tweaks and changes to yourself just to adhere to a company's leadership principles or, or what they expect from you in a performance review, then you begin to lose sight of your priorities in life and who you really are. And the fifth and final lesson for which I can't stress enough, you need to be present to win. With all that in mind, I chose to retire in my 40s. We sold our house in Seattle and we moved in the Midwest to be near my wife's family. I am choosing to spend my time creating this channel so that I can share with the rest of you how I'd made my millions and I could retire early. I want to help anyone I can to achieve early financial freedom. For me, there was no luck. There were no handouts. Everything that I obtained, I worked hard for. I put in the effort and I made good decisions. And I think that I can help you make good financial decisions too. And another reason for the channel is to provide a legacy to my children where I have little Easter eggs here and there for them to recognize. And unlike my mother, there will be recordings of me and my voice so my daughters won't forget me or what I sound like. When it's all said and done, it comes down to just one thing. You must be present to win.